Please join me in welcoming Susan to Google. We're really delighted to have her here. What a treat to be back. Yesterday was so much fun, and I see some repeat faces, people who brought their partners. You need to hear this. So it's my joy to do this work. It's my joy to speak with parents about perhaps the most important thing going on in our lives. Yes, we care very much about the world, the planet, our careers, our jobs. But something happens to us when we become a parent that, that changes us irreparably. I mean, I know for me, um, when I became a mother, actually, I had a, when I went into labor, I, I really <laughs> didn't know it was going to be that intense. So after the second, I think the second contraction, I told my then husband, I'm, I've changed my mind. <laughs> I don't want to do this, actually. <laughs> and 27 hours later, and nine and a half pounds later, I became a mother, and I'm, I'm a different human being in every possible way, not only because of the love that was birthed in my heart, but also because no one... I don't know if this is your experience, but nobody can push your buttons or challenge you like your children. I'm getting a lot of nods and laughs, so you know what I'm talking about. Because not only are we really not all that prepared for what it is to be responsible for the unrelenting demands of other people all the time, but also, you know, we're the same species. We, we don't become a different species when we become a parent. So we still get tired, overwhelmed. We still have our baggage from our own upbringing, feeling overpowered or invisible or whatever our particular flavor of challenge might have been as a child. And so when we become a parent, we have this opportunity to grow our children, raise them, but also to grow ourselves. And that's one of the, the gifts of this work and one of the reasons I have so much fun doing it. I speak all over the world. I've delivered the same talk or a similar in, in almost every continent. And then I do, as, as Ruchika said, a lot online. We have a lot of programs. I have a monthly membership where I've got people from every country that meet with me every month for you know not very many dollars a month, we just talk about whatever's up for them. So I'm working with parents now for you know progressively to help them internalize what what we're learning because the truth is the things I teach work really well. In fact, we were talking this morning because I did a three hour workshop here at Google yesterday, and then. And I've also done some other talks in the area, various organizations and churches and schools. And people try something the next day, and you were saying, just this one little adjustment avoided a meltdown with her two-and-a-half-year-old, or maybe two-year-old, right? And, and how, even though it isn't intuitive, the things I'm going to teach you today may not be how you were raised. It's not rocket science. It's not that difficult to begin doing it in a parenting in a way that both reassures our kids that there is a grown-up in the room, which is very comforting, <laughs> and that also um, preserves the love and the connection. A lot of us were good kids, right? We cooperated. Our parents said, do something. We did it. But sometimes that came at a cost. Sometimes we got sneaky and we just went underground about the thing we wanted to do that they were preventing us from doing. Or sometimes we just built up resentment. We did, or, or worse, maybe not worse, but we would also, when we were in trouble or struggling with something, and we needed a sane person to sort out the tanglements of our life, we would turn to our friends instead of our parents who had life experience and who who so, you know, hopefully cared about our best interests. 
So my work is very much about holding a place for our children that allows us to parent them, guide them, support them, uh, and continue to build a very deep and strong connection with them. So I'm going to go over a few things today, and then we'll have some questions. And let me start by giving you the, the initial piece, the, the fundamental piece of my work. And that is that I believe that parents need to be what I call the captain of the ship for their children. That means not that you're in control of your children. I am definitely not advocating control. I'm about being in charge, being the person that they can turn to. If you're you know, using this nautical theme, the captain of the ship, you know, if you're on a ship and you hear this whoop, whoop, alarm go off, you don't want the captain leaping over the side of the ship because he or she doesn't know what to do or is overwhelmed. You want the captain who's steady, who's calm, who's confident, who can handle the news that there's a leak or that there's a, a heavy storm ahead and doesn't jump ship. <laughs> I guess that's the term, right? And so the idea, I'm going to demonstrate a very simple hand motion for you so that you can remember it. And lots of people tell me that they, they and their partner will end up using these signals behind the children's back just to reinforce and remind themselves of holding this place for their children, even when our buttons are getting pushed. My right hand's going to represent the parent, and my left hand will be the child, OK? Parent child. I have a watch on the child hand, if that helps. So the child might say, um, <clears throat> maybe your, your nine-year-old says, um, Daddy, I, I want to watch horror movies from hell tonight at 11 o'clock. And you say, well, I'm afraid not. You know, because as the parent, as the captain, that's not a good idea. You, you know, you have a child who's very impressionable. Images are very powerful. This is a kid who's not going to sleep for the next six months if he watches Horror Night from Hell. So you say, well, I'm afraid not. And the child says, why not? And you say, now watch this carefully, because you'll have bad dreams. No, I won't. Yeah, you watched a movie that wasn't nearly that scary and you couldn't sleep for days. I know, but that movie had vampires and the blood was oozing. This movie... All my friends have seen it, and there is no vampire oozing blood in this movie. Well, honey, it's not about the oozing blood. <laughs> so who's in charge here, you guys? No one. Nobody's in charge here. So I call this the captain of the ship. When you go here, I call this the two lawyers. The two lawyers. This is where you're arguing. You're each arguing for your position. One is defending against the other, you're using rational thought and arguments to try and convince the other person of why you're right. Does that sound familiar to any of you? <laughs> yes, most parents say, oh, I live there. But wait, there's a, another, it devolves even further. If you don't let me watch that movie, I'm not doing my homework or I'm not doing my chores, or I'm not going to feed the dog, or I'm going to go be, tease my brother, you know, knock down his tower. And now you're down here, and you're, you're feeling internally. How are you feeling when you're, when you're like that? Like your child is attempting to put you into the corner, holding you hostage, desperate, angry, disrespected, out of control. And from this place, which I call the dictator, because dictators don't have authentic power. They have no genuine authority. They rule by fear and intimidation. They can wipe out bank accounts, throw your family in prison, take your home, confiscate your possessions. So it looks, it's faux power, but they don't have any genuine power. But from down here in the dictator mode, you will bribe or threaten. Because you feel overwhelmed and you feel out of control and in an attempt to feel in control again but remember this is not about control this is in charge you will assert your weight but that comes at a cost because your child now as I said there can be resentment there can be fear none of us like to be intimidated into doing what we're being asked to do do we so captain of the ship 
two lawyers, dictator. Everything that I teach and all these, uh, Ruchika talked about the summits and the membership program and the classes, I do online classes, everything is about this. Because when we come alongside our children, okay, so this is my little hand motion, rather than at our children as the lawyer who argues or as the dictator who threatens, when we come alongside them as that confident captain, life is so much easier. They want to say yes. They want to cooperate. They look to us for guidance. They're receptive to our wisdom. It's so much easier to parent. So I want to do a quick demonstration. Would you come up? And have I prepared you or anything? No. So he's not been primed. All I want you to do is face me right there. And if you put your hands out. Okay, ready? Okay. Great. Okay, thank you so much. A big round of applause for Martin. Did I ask you to push? No. No. But you pushed. And I've done this in every part of the every part of the world. Oh, okay. And without exception, everyone pushes. So it's not, I'm not, yes, you should have pushed, that's your instinct. And the reason for this is that we push against that which pushes against us. That's how we're wired. So when I began to push against him, of course he was going to push back. Now, if you were in the martial arts field, which some of you may be, I suppose you know that you could just move out of the way and let me fall forward of my own momentum. But we're not wired like that. So when you come at your child from that lawyer mode or from dictator, they are going to push back. If you'd like to have power struggles with your children, if that's your goal, come at them. Why didn't you start your homework? Of course you can't go see that movie. How many times have I told you to brush your teeth? All of those are push. And you will more often than not get pushed back. And there is a better way. I mean, that's the thing. If there was no other option, then I would say, oh, well, it'll, it, we all turned out all right. It's fine. But since there's a way to parent our children, staying present, staying in a, in a, in a more receptive, creating more receptivity, I think it's worth exploring. Not only because it so makes the climate in our home more peaceful and harmonious and happy and safe, Here's, a, here's the bonus. There's a bonus to this. We get to heal. We get to heal. I know in the raising of my son, doing it differently, certain things, of course, are similar to the way my parents raised me, but some of these things, as I learned along the way, and I certainly didn't know all this when he was first around either. I'm, I'm a work in progress. But so much healing has happened for me internally, even beyond therapy, just that, that this is what it feels like to, to be, be, watch a child bloom, watch a child feel they can shine and be who they're supposed to be and have their own point of view and feelings. And, you know, it's, it's a learning process for sure, but it's a, a glorious one. So, when we're captaining the ship, things go better. I want to give you some ideas for how you can do just that. The first piece that we know about what motivates children to see us as that captain is connection and attachment. So if, and I gave this example, remember, um, let's say that you were part of a, of a tribe. And so in times past or in some other part of the world, even today, and your child drifted or wandered over to the edge of the perimeter of that tribe's territory. Let's say it's your, your four-year-old child. And a stranger approaches from the other side and says, hey, you, come with me. Come. What do you want your child to do? Say no. And who do you want them to run back to? You, right. This is a good thing. <laughs> Children, this is very important, are wired to resist being bossed around. Newsflash. 
In case you hadn't noticed, children are wired to resist being bossed around. The good news is, because that would be highly inconvenient for us as parents, how do you ever get anything accomplished? Do they want to brush their teeth? No. Do they want to do their homework? No. Do they want to, right? We can override that instinct by attachment. So the child runs back to you because you're the one to whom he or she is connected. And we get, that's the loophole for this wise instinct that Mother Nature has embedded in our children for survival. We don't want them subject to the influence of those who might not have their best interests at heart. So it's good that they're wired to resist being bossed around outside that circle of safe influence. How do so so the way we override that, the way we foster greater greater receptivity, greater cooperation, begins with, as that captain, developing attachment, the way the roots of a tree go wide and deep, we we develop a sturdy foundation of connection. So here's the tree. Everyone see the tree above the ground? There's the tree. And below the tree are the roots. This is the root system. Now, the health of a tree is not really, you can't really determine by looking at what's going on above ground. It's really based on what you, what's going on in the ground, underneath. How wide and how deep and sturdy those roots are. So there are six stages of attachment that a child moves through in their first six years of life and then continues to go through in life. I used Neufeld's model, which I think is an excellent model in my courses and, and in what I teach, because it very clearly illustrates this beautiful journey of bonding and connecting. And if attachment is weak in any or all of these areas, you will see um, evidence of that in the child's defiance. It's not the only reason a child might be chronically oppositional or defiant. But if you have a child, when I get a call for coaching or in our membership, when somebody gets on, you know, gosh, you know, Tommy's just saying no to everything, one of the first things I'll ask is, what's the quality of the attachment? So when a baby is born, the journey of attachment begins, if you imagine the root just beginning to enter the ground here, the first movement into this process is proximity. That's the first stage. I talk about this in the books and in all my other things, but if you're taking notes, it's proximity. Proximity is the sound of your voice. It's smell, it's touch. It's very sense-oriented because that's where the infant is starting to connect with you. The second stage is sameness. So this is how two-year-old children acquire language. They mimic you. They want to be like you. And if you have, um, in one of my classes, I had the parent of a 16-year-old who was very, very drifting further and further away toward her friends, away from mom. And we started to look at where they had similar interests, and it was photography. And so she, she started to do photography with her daughter, sort of seriously pursuing it, and it reconnected them. And this can be true across the board. Even if you have a very young child, they like ponies, they like... I mean, they like Pokemon, whatever it is, that you, you look for a place where you have an interest, ideally, that you share, and you build connection in that way. The third stage, so the roots are going even wider and deeper, is belonging or loyalty. And this is the sense that the child feels that you're on her side. You know, we see issues of this, for instance, if you're the coach of your child's soccer team. And you're the coach. And so from time to time, you might have to treat your child like all the other children. And you might have to say, hey, dude, you know, you should have done this. Sometimes kids don't do very well with that because it compromises their feeling of loyalty or of dad or mom having their back. Three-year-old children in this state of developing attachment may push their sibling off of your lap. My daddy. It's my mommy. And they may also um, propose marriage to you. <laughs> I just love you so much, Mommy. Fourth stage, roots going even wider and deeper, is significance. And significance is the sense that the child feels seen and celebrated and cherished by you. 
just as they are. Not based on their achievements or their accomplishments or how good they make you look as a parent or as a person. It's the delight that you have in their existence in your life. And it's very, very powerful to, for children to feel cherished by you. It, it helps them feel close to you. The fifth stage around the eighth, the roots even going wider and deeper, is love. It's this pure, unadulterated transmission of warmth and connection that your child feels in your presence. Not just the words. It's the way your face might light up when they come into the room or they, they call you on the phone. I know when my son calls to this day, he's now six foot five and 26 years old. And if he walks in the house, it's like, woohoo, I just love him. And it's not just the words, it's this. I connect, I, I move into a place where I remember that love. I line myself up with it. It doesn't mean always. It doesn't mean I'm effusive all the time. Or, but, but, I, but there's something very pure about that that is felt. We feel it with anyone who we love. And then the final stage, if all has gone well with these stages, from the age of six onward is being known. Being known. So this is the child who wants to tell you their secrets, doesn't want to hold back from you, feels safe. And we teach children by our reactions, because if we react to their news rather than responding in ways that make them feel ashamed or afraid, then we teach them not to tell us what's really going on in their lives especially as life gets more complicated. So if you want your 14-year-old to tell you when she's thinking about um, drinking with her girlfriends on Friday night because they're all going to try it, then you want to ideally make it possible for your 4-year-old, when that child is 4, to come to you when she's afraid of something or someone's been mean to her at school or maybe she was mean to someone and got in trouble. You want to make it safe because you're that captain who responds rather than reacts out of your own hurt or need or story. Does that make sense? So we can fortify and build connection with our children all through their lives. Proximity means you, me. Let's play a game of chess, right? I seek out the child when they're not chasing me or hanging onto my leg. Please, one more game of Candyland. But you initiate out of a generosity. Once in a while, go find your child when they're not expecting it or demanding and say, hey, I just had this great idea. Do you want to go color in your coloring book together? And they haven't even asked for it? Wow, that's amazing. Sameness. Look for something the two of you enjoy doing and do it. Take a cooking class. Go, go study the bugs in the backyard if you have at least some interest in your child's fascinated. Belonging and loyalty. If they have a homework assignment, rub their shoulders, make them a cup of tea, be on their side, let them feel that you're on their team. And I've talked about significance and love and being known. So these are very fundamental elements of my work that when we change what I call the pH of our relationship with our child. So imagine there's a cylinder with a solution in it. And it's funny, I'm at Google. <laughs> I have zero background in science, so I'm going to sound like I know more than I do. This is like the one thing I kind of know. So if you had a solution that was too acidic, the pH of that solution is too, has too much acid, you don't neutralize it by removing acid. You add alkaline. You add base. If I get a call or I, I'm working with a family where the child is chronically resistant or defiant, one of my first questions will be, how would your child rate that, the level of attachment on these six areas in, 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 or the overview? Because typically, a child who feels very close to you and connected tries their best to behave for you. They want to please you, just like you do. You try harder for someone that you genuinely like, who you feel genuinely likes and enjoys you. Than, than out of obligation or duty. It's just how we are. So these 
stages of attachment, while simple, are so fundamental to being the captain of the ship because they change the pH of that relationship so it's healthy. So you have something kind of to work with. Does that make sense so far? So far so good? Okay. There's a second piece that goes into being that captain. I won't go into this too much. This is a, a, a deeper topic, but I want to just touch on it. So imagine that you're holding a snapshot. I always think of Polaroids, and I'll bet many of you, if not most of you, don't even know anymore what a Polaroid picture was. But in my day, which wasn't that long ago, there were these cool cameras, and you could instantly take a picture and print it. So I always picture the Polaroid. So here's the Polaroid, and this picture that you're holding is of your ideal child. This is the child who, when you say, um, sweetheart, it's time to start your homework, they say, sure, mom, thanks for reminding me. <laughs> and this is the child when you say, honey, it's time to brush your teeth and get in your jammies. They go, oh, great, I'm just so ready for that. <laughs> good night. Have a good night, mommy. I know you're so tired. You get a good sleep now. <laughs> right? This is your snapshot child. I call it snapshot child syndrome. How many of you suffer from snapshot child syndrome? And the reason that we move into lawyer mode or dictator mode is that we lose our cool. Happens to the best of us. And and so I'm always interested in getting to the root of things. Like, I'm not a Band-Aid person. I'm not a person that scripts for you what, here's what to say when your children are fighting in the back seat. Here's what to say when you found out your daughter was cheating. I want to know why. Why does, some, why does that behavior make sense? So the root of this issue of why we lose our cool and move into that argumentative lawyer where we're pushing, or that dictator, who's overpowering and intimidating to feel some sense of faux control is, is not because our child's kicked down his brother's tower. It's because we think he shouldn't have. It's the mismatch between this photo of our idealized child and that real one in flesh and blood in front of us. That mismatch causes us to lose our cool. Does that make sense? It's an inside job. It's what we're believing in our head that contradicts reality. Ruchika mentioned Byron Katie, and I don't know if any of you are familiar, but I love the work of Byron Katie, and I've been doing some parenting programs with her, and it's been such a delight because she has a, a, a process of inquiry that I include in my books and in my classes, we won't do it right now, but that gets you to look at the stories that you're telling and believing that cause you to create stress and distance and difficulty in your life and in your relationships. <coughs> so staying captain means that we have to throw the snapshot away. This is the child you have. For better or worse, maybe it's not what you expected. I think for most of us, if <laughs> not all of us, if we're really allowing our child to be who they are, there's going to be some variation between the, the imagination that we had of who they might be and their personality. Maybe you have a child who's... I've had sessions with people on the phone who, who end up sobbing within 10 minutes because uh, this person is a very gentle, was very passive, was, as a, as a little girl, not allowed to really be very assertive or express herself, and she's got this intensely fiery five-year-old. No, I'm not going to do that. And, and boy, you know, mom just bumps up against that. Now, on the one side, where we've gotten to in, in our work is what a gift. This daughter is revealing to her how she can locate within herself her own strength, her own will, to some degree. Maybe not in the clumsy and intense way that her child is. Sometimes you're a very intense person and you really are competitive and you love sports and you get this very gentle, sensitive little child. Not like you. So it's when we are stuck on holding this image up against the real child that we lose our cool. And we try and argue them into or intimidate them into being different than they are. So that's a side piece that helps us be the captain. 
looking at what we're believing our child should be, looking at the story that we're telling in our head of how they should feel, he shouldn't knock down the, t the tower. Is it true? What are three reasons why your little boy should have knocked down his brother's tower? And I know that, don't take that literally. I'm not suggesting he should have knocked it down. But if we look at that question, why does this behavior make sense? Then I'll bet we could find why that was an obvious outcome of what had happened up in the moments or hours leading up to that. Does that make any sense to you? So we look at the snapshot, we throw it away, and we, we meet the child where they are. The third piece that's so important, and I want to make sure I cover this today, is about coming alongside our children rather than coming at them. So I talk about um, how when a child is frustrated, it's like they're on this road of frustration. Here's the road. It's called frustration. Okay. Children are on this road many, many times a day. They can't have the cookie that they want. They have to go to school, and they'd rather stay home with you. They don't want to go to bed. They don't want to brush their teeth. They don't like you holding their little brother. All kinds of things happen where children are frustrated. So the goal of, of our parenting life is not about preventing them from ever being frustrated. Far from it, in fact. My position is that it's very important for children to discover they can survive and live through frustration. Why? How else are they going to develop resilience? Children become resilient because they know they can survive something difficult. So our job is not to fix everything for them or move the universe over to where they would prefer that it be. But it's to be that loving, compassionate, present captain through the storm. So the child's on this road of frustration, and there's only two ways this can go. If they go this way, in that direction, they come to a fork in the road. So there's only, when they come to the fork, if they go this way, they become aggressive. I hate you, you're so mean. Maybe they take it out on their sibling or on the family dog or they, they hate, I hate myself. We see that. But if they come to the fork in the road of frustration and they go this way, the end of that little path is adaptation acceptance. They come to terms with life as it is. However, <laughs> however, it's a process that you can help them with. So I've borrowed from the work of Elizabeth Kubler-Ross in Death and Dying because the way I see it, frustration in a way is, is like loss. It may be loss of autonomy or freedom of choice. It may be loss of you if they have to go to school. It may be loss of a really good cookie. And so I work with this model of grief because in a way it's a, it's a small condensed grieving process to get through that loss. So who has an example? Does someone want to share an, a, an example of a time when a child has made a complaint? Actually, it just happened yesterday. My 12-year-old came home from school with a big, sad Aww. attitude and went straight to his bed. And that's very unlike him because normally he's very happy, positive. And I went to him and I said, what is the problem? And he said, I can't believe it. Somebody slashed my backpack while I left oh, it outside the bathroom. Yeah. Yeah. Why would they do that? And I was, you know, yeah. I could totally understand where he was coming from because he felt like he was violated. Yes. And in that process, that, I'm so, so sorry to hear that. In that process, really, I already can watch you and get a sense that you just joined him where he was. And so that's a great example of her getting to the end of this process, which is, feeling sad. So I, if it's all right with you, I'm going to invent a, another version just because you already did it. <laughs> okay. So let's say that your child complains that um, he never, he, he doesn't get to watch more TV and he really wants to watch this one more program. Okay. Does that anybody relate to that? Just this one more program. Does anyone want to play this out with me? All right, I'll just do it. So we have we have a shot. Yeah, it's okay. And also we're on camera. So. so the child says to you, Mom, Dad, I just want to watch one more show. This is a really important episode. 
And we'll pretend there aren't DVRs and all that, okay, for the purposes of this demonstration. So the child, when you say, I'm afraid not, it's time to start your homework or get ready for dinner, first goes into the, the, on the, on the road to acceptance, first steps into denial. Because maybe he or she, he has reason to believe that you may change your mind based on prior experiences. If I rally hard enough, maybe I'll get to watch this show. So come on, please, I just want to watch this show. So the child's first in denial. If you still say no, then we're in anger. You're so mean. You never let me do anything. You're, you're so strict. Like, Jacob's parents let him do what, I mean, he gets to watch like five of these episodes. You're so strict. So there's anger. You all familiar with what I'm talking about? Next, if we don't engage on that level, we have bargaining. Please, if you just let me watch this one episode, I promise I'll never ask for anything again for the rest of my life. This is the only thing I want. I promise you, if you just let me watch this show, I'll never ask for anything. I'll do all my chores. I'll feed the dog. I'll massage your feet, whatever it is. Okay. Now, if that doesn't yield the desired outcome, we'll move on. But it's not so easy because those are invitations to go into lawyer and dictator mode, right? So your child denial, you know, he's going to just push and push. Then anger, you might counter the anger with threats or anger of your own. If he moves into bargaining, you may go into lawyer mode. Well, no, because I know that's not true. You've promised many times before that's the only thing you wanted, and then 10 minutes later you wanted something else. Well, that was different, because, says your child, because that was when, you know, I mean, listen, you're going nowhere fast if you go there. These first three stages where there's conflict and tension, I call it the DAB, denial, anger, bargaining. So the model is DABDA. So the first three stages, the dab, we perpetuate, we prolong the misery by arguing, by threatening, all those things. The fourth stage, which is where the, the shift actually can happen, which is what you were talking about with your son, is disappointment. Now in Kubler-Ross's model, it was depression. It's the disappointment. It's inhabiting the, your sadness. It's slamming against the truth that I am not going to have what I wanted. I have to let go. For your son, it, my, it was the truth and the sad truth that somebody was so unkind who he has contact with. For the child who wants to watch another show, it's the realization of the futility of his effort. He is not going to get to watch that show. So there's a, some children, they need to cry. Some kids just feel it, a, a sinking feeling. And if you can hold the cap in place without being tempted to, but it's only for your own good, or right? mm -hmm. which is what we do. But you've gotten so many things you don't appreciate. If you'd appreciate me more and all the hard work I do and the organic food I buy, then I, would, I might feel differently. But if we stay clean, as that captain, then the child magically moves through this process to the final step, which is acceptance. They make peace with life as it is. They come to terms with it. And we have not fractured or compromised the relationship. Does that make sense? This is not easy because when we have a child, every bone in our body wants them to be happy. So if a child is unhappy or complaining, a lot of times we go down here because we feel a desperate need for them to like us or to feel happy again. So we, we change the world to suit them because they don't, we don't like witnessing them being unhappy. And I'm not saying you never change your mind. By the way, here's the back door. Let's say that you're super tired. Would you like, like a, an out, a loophole for this? Let's say you're really tired. And your tradition is that you um, read two bedtime stories at night. And you've read your two stories, and your child's like, oh, 
Then I have a third story. And they haven't yet lost their mind or they're not being awful. They just would really like another story. And in your mind, you kind of weigh the pros and cons. Do I want to do this thing that Susan Stiffelman was talking about? Or do I just want to get this over with? So what I remember, I just want you to be the captain. So if they're being reasonable and you, you, know, you think it might be quicker and easier just to read the other, an extra story, you know what you get to say? Oh my gosh, you must be a mind reader. I was about to suggest we read another story. <laughs> That's amazing. Or it's, you know, they want the other cookie. How did you, how did you know I was about to ask you if you wanted another cookie? So you make it your idea. And you still hold that place, that loving place. So I know that we have just a few minutes and I want to take some questions, but I wanted to sort of tie this up with the last piece that goes into being the captain, just briefly. When we come at our children, you can't watch that show. It's a scary movie. You're too young. What do we get from them? Pushback, resistance, right? We can move into that anger. When we come alongside them with what I call Act One parenting, then we help the child feel understood, validated, and they soften. And there's a... a, a the guard comes down, the walls come down, there's a receptivity. And we use Act One with what I just taught you with helping the child feel sadness. So here's an example. Um, the child says, I, I hate my school and I never want to go back to that stupid school. I hate it. They come home from school and say that to you. Most of us do what I call Act Two parenting. We appeal to the child's left, logical, rational, language-based brain even though when they're upset, they don't have one of those. And I know I'm oversimplifying, but Dan Siegel reassured me a couple of weeks ago that I can still talk about the brain as having these different functions, so I'm comforted by that. So we appeal to them with rational, logical arguments to talk them out of their position. Does that work? No. Not when they're already upset, because when they're upset, they're over here in their feeling emotional brain. That's where we need to join them. We do that with what I call Act One Parenting. Act One Parenting allows the child to be where he is, stays the captain, we stay the captain, we aren't wordy. Most of us say way too many words and I'm convinced kids tune us out after about seven. <laughs> and we um, Acknowledge briefly, I call it comic book language, like, oh, mm, shoot, boy, pow, bam, kaboom. Okay, so we're minimalist when it comes to words, but we're empathic. And most important, and this is a little formulaic, we, we look to help the child nod his head or say yes at least three times so that it diffuses, wow, you're actually hearing me. Not like you're angry. Because I would never presume to decide I know what someone else is feeling. So please don't attribute that approach to me because I don't believe it's our right to decide how someone is feeling and announce it as if we know. But we could say it sounds like, I get the feeling that, it seems as though. So let me demonstrate this and then I'd love to take some questions. Is there anyone brave who has an issue, a, a child who's complained about something and they want to play this out with me? All right, so you're my, how old are you? How old do you want to be? Eight-year-old. Eight-year-old, okay. So you're my eight-year-old, and what's your complaint? First, I'm going to demonstrate Act 2, which is what I don't want you to do, but you will probably intuitively do, because that's how we were, most of us were raised. Okay, what's your complaint? Uh, you spend Here. All, oh, yeah. You spend all the time with my little brother, and you don't spend any time with me. Can you stand here so we Yeah. That's ridiculous, honey. Uh, here, I'm knocking on her left. That's your left, right? <laughs> I'm knocking on her. That's ridiculous. I, I played My Little Pony with you for like two hours yesterday. And he was wanting my attention. Mm. But today you didn't spend any time. Well, today because we had to go to the doctor's office and I had to take... But mm, I'm right here with you. I'm here. Mommy. Okay, so how's this feeling to you? 
very disconnecting. Very I'm disconnect. disputing, I'm arguing, I'm invalidating, right? So can you all relate to that? There's almost an urgency that we feel like, let me just quickly talk you off the ledge. Let me quickly talk you out of what you're feeling. And I seem to believe, for whatever reason, largely how we were raised, that the quickest route to that is to convince your left logical brain to think differently. It just doesn't work. By the way, I've done this same program for businesses and employee relationships and couples. I mean, this is not just confined to the parent-child relationship, this dynamic. But we know that that didn't, that didn't go over. Did, did you all relate? Okay, so now I'm going to model Act 1. You may see me in this Act 1 demonstration guiding her to some sadness through that dabda. Okay, ready? So make the same complaint. You always spend time with my little brother, but no time with me, Mommy. So now in my mind, I might be thinking, that is so far from the truth. But here's what I'm going to do. So it seems like you feel shortchanged. Yeah. And like your brother's been getting more time than... Yes. And I wonder if you kind of miss me. I do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm so glad you told me. <laughs> and of course, it's not always that tidy and simple, but how was that for you? Oh, felt more connected? Yeah. That you care? Yeah. yeah. I'm not arguing her out of her position. Now, there's so many ways this could go. It might be that I find out that it's not really, sadly, about me at all and my fabulousness, but really that her friends left her to eat by herself at lunch. Right? If I, if I make room for her to feel, express herself safely, and tell me, is there more to that, honey? Is there more about that you want me to know? Yeah, I feel really alone these days because there's no friends at ah, school. Right. Now, in my left brain, I'm thinking, I picked her up and saw her playing with seven people <laughs> on the playground. <laughs> so the temptation is very great to say, what are you talking about? The typical thing would be, but I saw you with you know, da 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 And instead, I join her where she is, so it feels like you're just on your own a lot, huh? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no friends. Huh. That doesn't sound fun. Mm -hmm. Is there anything that you think you want me to help you with about that? Mm. I'd like to have a play date with Ella. I wonder if we could set that up. So there's, there's a possible, I've empowered her, to be a participant in solving it. Thank you, thank you, that's good. It may also be that um, that it, she just has to cry. It may be she's going through a rough patch with all of her friends. It may be, not that this would be for your child, that she's not being a very nice friend and she's been very bossy or very controlling of the other kids and so she's getting honest feedback. But I wanna know that because I'm the captain and there may be a leak in the hull of my ship. And if I make everything glossed over and perfect, and I only want to hear the good stuff, I really can't effectively parent. So, um, all these things are, are interplaying with each other to be that loving, present captain of the ship. And in the process, this is what I said at the beginning, we get to heal our unfinished business that looms its angry face sometimes when we feel disrespected or overwhelmed or confused or sad or maybe I was that child who had no friends and now I'm going to jump through hoops to make sure that by gosh every child on that playground plays with my daughter so I don't have to reactivate my own pain of loneliness as a child. Not a healthy way to go. I work through my own material. I support my child with the resources that she has. She's a different person. So it's a pretty magnificent process. And I, as I said, just feel overjoyed to have landed in what feels like the work I'm supposed to do and have met so many amazing parents around the world. Um, even in the online community, I have a Facebook group and I have a, oh yeah, I'm supposed to say I have this newsletter. You said I was gonna say this. If you'd like to stay in touch with the work I'm doing, please send a, news, uh, a text message I'll just give you this phone number with the word newsletter in it. It's 310-905-8165. 
905-8165. And you can be part of our movement, our tribe. We're doing so many interesting things. The next program coming up is on co-parenting with a narcissist. And very, very interesting with a woman who wrote, a, she's a, a highly respected expert in the field, Wendy Behari, called Disarming the Narcissist. But we do all kinds of parenting programs online so that we can reach people remotely, just as we're doing today. So who has a question that they'd yeah. like to ask? Uh, so we have a younger kid, uh, one year and four months. And so do you have any tips for how to communicate with kids who don't talk yet? Sure. So you have a one-year-old, so it's pre-verbal. So some of the things I'm talking about aren't quite relevant to you yet. They will be if you blink about five times. <laughs> That's how fast it changes. So it's great that you're learning now. In fact, I want to do more work with expectant parents because they have more time to actually start learning new approaches, and then they can be more prepared. Um, with a young child, a lot of the work I do tends to do with you, so that as you start to feel overwhelmed or stuff starts getting triggered for you, you have the resources to kind of look at your own side of the equation. And then with a toddler, you'll be doing a, a micro, like a, a very simplified version of some of this. Like, I love Harvey Karp, who talks about um, um, when a toddler really wants something that you don't get real wordy, you, you go to match about 30% of the affect. You want, you want, you want to go outside so you can meet your child on a very primal, simple level, even though the verbal processing may not be what you, you know, they may not be able to perfectly translate, they'll get the feeling. And so you acknowledge them in that way and, um, and, and prepare yourself for what's to come. One of the things that happens in our house sometimes is uh, they'll ask for, you know, one of my two daughters will ask for something like, another dessert or more screen time or something like that and we'll say no and then they'll say why which is I, th I think a real invitation to go into lawyer mode there yeah. um, so what do you think is a you know some good approaches to handle Great. that? I love the question a lot of times when you have established that something is not an option the child will say why and I want you to get this it's code for I really want it <laughs> it's not why Right. You're just getting confused because you think that the word part of a child's message is actually their message. That is not the case. When a child is feeling a lot of feelings, there's this gauzy wrapping paper that they wrap around the emotional content of what's going on for them. And they deliver this gauzy wrapping, wrapped up thing, a feeling, and the gauzy wrapping paper is the word part of the message. It is not the message. And so. There will be times, however, when your child is calm, respectful, and says, I really want to know why. And you can say, are you sure? Do you want to know why you can't have the dessert? Or is this your way of saying, I really want the dessert? I would just ask her. Get it clear. I'm not sure if you're saying uh, that you genuinely want my rational reasons, or if this is just another version of, I so desperately want that dessert. Tell me which it is. Now, I will also point out that in my work, I don't suggest that you keep saying, I know you really want the dessert, but you can't have it. I know it's really good, but I told you no. I know that you really want more dessert, but in our house, you only get one. If you keep reiterating the no, first of all, it's like salt in the wound. It's kind of mean. But it also disempowers you. Because if you know what, and this is why many parenting issues, when I do work with my members, a lot of it is just, helping parents become more clear and decisive. When you're clear, you have an aroma. And that's the captain thing. And, um, and so you may need to get super clear, but once you're clear, don't keep saying, no, you can't, but here's why, but no. You said it once, it's already established in your house. I wouldn't even touch it. I know you really want the dessert. I know it doesn't seem fair. Not, I know it doesn't seem fair, but we don't have second desserts in our house. Does that make sense to you? Am I saying that? Okay. So um, my nine-year-old daughter, she's really addictive to a uh, Nintendo console game. So, um, so when she's not playing, she's you know trying to get onto YouTube to watch other people yeah. playing all the time. So, so I'm thinking about maybe I should because myself I have no interest in game at all. So. So I'm, I'm thinking about maybe I should consider playing with her or 
to be more attached with her in terms of this interest? Do you think that's a good way to it's a really that? Really interesting question. I just did a, a this year. It's still on susansiffelman.com. You can still get that uh, wonderful series on parenting the digital age, and um, it's a huge topic for me that I've been writing and thinking and teaching about. And that question is is a tangled one. I would prefer that you find an interest that doesn't involve parallel looking at a screen, more contact, more real life 3D engagement. That's what I would prefer. Now, I'm not saying this is at all true for your daughter. There are children, for instance, on the spectrum, with some degree of autism or Asperger's, where that is a very effective way and perhaps the easiest way to connect. And there are children who are depressed. And again, this is not your daughter. But I have, um, when I've done my classes, when we start to work with helping kids sort of wean off unlimited amounts of time on the screen, it's often a mask or a cover-up for anxiety and depression. And I would, all, all, I, I would want to rule that out, that she is able to function and enjoy the world. Because otherwise, it's just covering up another issue, which sadly is true for many children. Um, many kids, that's the only time they feel good or relaxed or safe. And then finally, um, you know, it's a process. And you would need to be clear about what the limits are. But I guess my short, shorter, coming back to the original answer, would be I wouldn't mind her teaching you a little bit about the game as an entry point. But I guess I would prefer that you think outside the box for something really interesting, maybe as an offshoot, maybe drawing Nintendo characters or building them out of something that's a little more 3D. Actually, she did try to teach me, but I guess I did not meet her expectation. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's good information. It's not your thing. And you can be very honest with her and say, here's the truth. I love authenticity with our kids. They, they love the truth and they smell it anyway. Sweetheart, I'm wanting to connect with you more. I was thinking maybe I would try Nintendo, but clearly it's just not my in my wheelhouse. So here, let's, here's a big pad of paper. Let's just together write all the things we love doing and see where there's some overlap. And make that an activity, a bonding activity to do with her to come up with ideas of other things that you could do. It could be digging holes in the backyard. I don't care what it is could be a worm farm. Okay, I guess that's it. We need to wrap up. Thank you all for tuning in and, and listening. Um, thank you so much, Ruchika, for yeah. hosting this event. And I um, look forward to staying in touch yeah, with thank you. all of you. Thank you, Susan, for coming.